Thank you, Chris. So hello and welcome today. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some practical tips that you can do yourselves to increase sales or leads on your own websites by finding those areas of weakness that already exist. If you do find any of this useful, please use the hashtag as you go along. If you've got any questions, come to me after. So as Chris said, I've been doing this for 10 years and I started by designing and building websites. And now I focus on making things easier for people to use. And that's done by two ways. That's done by user experience and then done by optimizing the website itself. But I'm not going to be talking about conversion rate optimization nonsense or CRO. I think it's got a bit of a bad name, especially from user experience professionals more like myself. It can be seen as a bit of a shady dark art or a bit of a get rich quick scheme. And some of their techniques and suggestions are definitely a bit questionable. If you do a search for CRO hacks, you'll find thousands of articles like this. Guides and tips telling you the 10 things you need to do to your site. How do they know your site? How do they know your customers? Like Baron said, you need to understand what they're trying to do. So how can they tell you what's right? This is one of their best tips. It's a, it's a pop-up. Now, we used to hate these, right? We still do, I think. But now people are actively encouraging putting these back on sites, whether that's at the start of the page, whether it's once you try and get them to leave, or any time in the journey. And Google have understood that people really find this annoying. And they've actually started penalizing websites which have pop-ups when you come onto the site. They've actually started bringing you down the rankings if you start doing this. So instead of trying to market to everyone who's coming to your site like a piece of advertising, try and find out why they're there. Because all you're doing otherwise is just bombarding them all with the same message. And it's not going to resonate with all of them. So instead, think of your website like an airport. Now nobody likes going to airports, few people like going on planes, but they're trying to get somewhere. And so your website is trying to release your goal to somebody else. So find out what they need to do on that site. As you might have gathered, my big focus is on users first. Quick wins in the web industry are hard to come by and definitely harder to replicate time and time again. So when people come to me, I have to find a process that I can repeat for every single customer. I find that by improving usability and the customer experience first, that then lends itself to increased conversions and then generating more sales and leads. So websites work for the business basically, and we're trying to make them work harder. Most sites will try and increase some of these metrics, things like sales, revenue, or customer retention, customer acquisition, or to reduce costs. So what you've got to think about is how can you make your website improve these sort of numbers for the business? So a website itself has its own unique metrics and goals. Things like conversions and form submissions are the key ones. And some people refer to traffic and bounce rate as the kind of metrics that you need to look at. Well actually, if your traffic increases tenfold, but conversions go down, is that actually a result you want to be doing? So think about the metrics that actually matter. <laughs> the way you can bridge the gap between this is by tracking secondary events and goals to understand the, in, uh, the interaction and engagement that people have on your site. So things like clicking on a button or watching a video, maybe somebody creating a product. Because if you can find out that people are more likely to buy a product when they've watched the video, maybe you could do something to promote that video on product pages a bit more. If you find pages with a lot of form members, focusing on improving that form is going to have a direct correlation to improving the form submissions. But the problem with tracking too many things is that you're going to get information overload. Again, you've tracked too many points and you're spending all your time looking at this data. And this is a new problem. Back in the 15th century, the printing press came out and everyone wanted books. So people were collecting books, but they had so many books they couldn't read them all. And it's the same with our data. We need to find out what we should spend our time reading and looking at and dismiss the stuff that isn't going to give us any information. Because the data that distracts us is worse than, worse than useless. And this is the big difference between data and insights. 
I've been in a lot of meetings where people just report on data. They've said the traffic's gone up or down about 10%. But they've not said this is because of any sort of reason. And they've not said because of this, this is what we're recommending to do. So it's just a historical record. So instead, trying to find out a bit of insight, a bit of information that you can report back to your team that can actually make a change. Because if you can learn something from it, then you can act on it. So have a think about what matters to your business, how you can track that on your own website, and how you can report on it to make some better decisions. As Baron said, no two visitors are the same, but they can have similar trends. He's mentioned about Google Analytics, and I think it's a great place to start. But of course, it's not necessarily going to tell you what's going on. But if you've got a big site with lots of pages, where you can find out that these are the key areas to look at. But don't look at the averages of the site, because that's just going to be an aggregate, and nobody's going to find out any information from that. So try and find out ways of breaking it down. This is a Google Analytics report that we've created, and what it does is it allows you to track high traffic pages with a high bounce rate. So this bounce rate report basically identifies the motorway pages on your site. And by looking at these, you can make some big changes because a lot of people are coming to those pages and then leaving again. Now that might be fine for things like contact pages, but when you look through that list, you need to ask yourself, are they the right sort of pages for people to be living on, or should I try and direct them somewhere else? And of course, with bounce rates, everyone wants to know what the right bounce rate is. Well, to be honest, it really depends on what the page is, whether it's a contact page, whether it's a home page. And it depends completely on your own business. So I say focus on your own targets, because the data out there isn't necessarily accurate, because the information isn't easy to gather. I was talking to a retailer the other day, and they told me that their e-commerce conversion rate has gone up to 8%. Now, that's a big leap from where they were before, but I think if you were looking at traditional averages, that would be far exceeding what they would expect. But because they focused on just improving the customer experience they had, they weren't looking at competitors and worrying about what competitors were doing, because you can't influence those. So focus on your own targets, don't worry about other people's balance rates, and just look to reduce your own. Now, a lot of people will say, I really like how John goes to it, or doesn't Amazon have a great checkout experience? Well, I don't think it does. If you actually watch it, it has some pretty nasty ideas. Um, I've not signed up to Prime, but it keeps on asking me if I really want to sign up to Prime, uh, but I don't. But through a checkout journey, it actually comes up with a pop-up asking if you do. Now, if you did that on your own site, you just turn it through away. But also because it's Amazon, they can do these things. Because you're not asking the sort of ideas and the sort of questions that you might have with another retailer. You know about the delivery and returns methods they have, and you trust them. But if you're doing those sort of things on your own website, people might think twice about checking out. So going back and looking at your own pages, and I've taken a product page as an example, what you need to do is start looking into and questioning the elements on the page that might not be working very well. Is that product too expensive? Is it more expensive than competitors or in the rest of the range? Or is it information that people are looking for that might not be there? Now usability testing would find this sort of stuff out because people might be looking for the material or the fabric and if it's not on there and they can't find it, that's going to hamper their purchasing decision. Again, is the imagery of a decent quality and showing the right sort of information. If this was an electronics product, you might want to show the back so that you can find out what the ports are. And does that product have decent reviews? Because we know reviews have such an important weighting on choice and preference. So if your products have lower reviews than you'd like, maybe you need to try and push some positive reviews out or get people to review the products. That product might not be the right one for people, but if you've got product recommendations, are they the right sort? Because I've seen a lot where they're completely different. And the point is, if you're trying to give people suggestions, 
It's like somebody in the shop recommending you products. If they were recommending you a completely different product, you'd say, well, why are you asking me this? Why are you asking me if I want that? I'm looking at a, looking at a jacket. I don't want a shirt or trousers. And we know from research that only half the content on the page is read, 49%. So people were skim reading and they're trying to find the information they're looking for. Now, of course, it's harder to do that in eight paragraphs of text. So what you need to do is break out the information into clear headlines and bullet points. So that for skimmers, they can find the information really easily. But for people who are looking at all the content, they can still make it just as easy to find. The key here is you need a little bit of creative thinking. The insights aren't going to just bounce out at you, but you need to question it enough and look around to find out where you should be making the changes. So I'm going to give you a bit of a, an exercise here. We've got a number spelled out with some matchsticks. And if you're only allowed to move two of the matchsticks, what's the highest number, highest possible number you could create? Now if you have CSV4 and you know it, don't give the game away. See if you can talk to the person next to you and find out what the biggest number you could possibly get is. I'll give you a few seconds to do that. moving two matchsticks. See, I didn't say you could create another number or another digit. And that's pretty, that's pretty high. I think that was one of the highest numbers. I can make that number even bigger just by changing the perception. So if you turn upside down, you'll get 800,000. So the information was already there. It's just how you look at it and how you read it that's going to give you the right key and that little bit of creative thinking to try and find out what changes you could make to your site. So can you be a bit more creative with your imagery and make people want ice cream? <coughs> if you're still not sure what's causing a page to perform poorly, there are a couple of other techniques you can do to build up a picture. You can do things like heat maps, session corners, and usability studies, like Baron mentioned. And I'll go through some of these. Scroll maps show how far people are going down your site. And if you find that people aren't really engaging with the rest of your content, you need to find a way of making that happen. So the red part are where most people are seeing it, and it gets colder as fewer and fewer people see that content. And what you can see here is on a mobile view, people just aren't reading the content. So it might be the best content in the world, but if people aren't reading it, how can you convey the message to them? How can, can you, how can you convey the right message? You can also track mouse movements. Now mouse move, movements have about an 80% correlation with eye movements. So basically what this is somebody doing is moving their mouse and reading as they're doing it. And this is an actual uh, page for a landing page. And what we found were a lot of people looking at the navigation so that would make me question, if they've just landed on this page and they're looking at the navigation, maybe it's not the right page for them. But we did see some nice bits around the call to action and some of the lower text. So maybe it's just a portion of the audience that was the wrong page. You can then begin looking into form interactions and find out how long it takes for every single person to fill up form fields. And again, on this example, we found out that the business name field was taking a little bit longer for people to fill up. What we did is we watched some recordings, and we found that as people were typing in their postcode, the name was coming up. But what happened was people were moving straight on to the next 
form filter. So then they had to go back and refill it. Now that's annoying and frustrating, and it might not necessarily stop that person from converting. But if you can make the process really quick and seamless, it's just a better experience. We also found out that six out of seven people opted out of additional marketing, which is no real big surprise. I really like this session recording video of AO.com. It goes through a couple of times. If you've ever shopped on something online, you're probably going to try and find the cheapest place to get it. And they understood this on AO. What they did is they watched somebody copy the product code, and of course what they would have done is gone straight into Google, popped it in a search, and found out the cheapest place. So what they did is they tried to hold on to that customer and stop them from leaving. As you see, as you double click and copy the product code, it actually says we price match, and it brings in the competitors' prices as well. So if you had any question over price, you're told immediately, we've got the best price, and we'll match it. So don't leave our site and use somebody else's. We've been doing some usability studies, and we found lots of different problems. And I'm going to show you a couple here. This is a development problem. This is a site with filters, and each of the filters has one product listed. What happened is, when you clicked on one of those products, it filtered again, and then it said there were 38 products. Now, to anyone browsing the list, they think, well, you don't really have any products around, do you? Or I don't know how many uh, metal chairs you have, or how many wood chairs you have. And that's a development problem that nobody else picked up until we did a video and showed it back to them. We also had the uh, lovely live chat pop up. And, and live chat's great, it's, it can be really useful. But the problem is on this site, is that it came up every single time, on every single page. And I was watching this person close the live chat down, and then close it out again on the next page. And this happened about eight times. And it wasn't remembering that they didn't want to do live chat. And every single time it was taking up that much space and just frustrating them. And I think if we weren't asking this person to use the site, they probably just end up leaving. We then found a problem of actually a broken link. So we were asking somebody to go through a journey and find out some information. They clicked on the link and it took them to somewhere else completely. So, you know, analytics isn't necessarily going to tell you that that's happening. And because you look at your own site so often, you might not have noticed that. But by doing some little exploratory testing, you can find quick wins. And of course, if you saw that, you'd fix it easily, quickly, and just stop it from happening. So from a little bit of testing, you can find out all sorts of different areas of weakness. Again, quick wins. No one will question that those sort of things are things you should change and improve. And there's little risk in there just making those simple fixes. So putting all of these bits together, the analytics, the videos, the heat maps, the form fields, you build up a picture of where the best changes can come from. And there shouldn't be much risk in these sort of things. You can also look at reviews, and uh, reviews of searches. So if people search on your own site, especially on those pages which have zero results, is that an area that you need to be going into? Is it because people are searching and they're calling it something different than you want? So try and find out and learn what sort of behavior is from that. And you can also, obviously with analytics, segment the audience into all many, so many different ways, and then run the same sort of tests, and the same sort of exercises to find out whether social media people versus organic traffic are getting the right sort of experience. And this comes back to the usability side, it's understanding behavior and the people behind that purchase. Because if you're not able to understand, then how can you communicate to them in the right sort of way? In a recent study, three out of 10 companies said they had an up-to-date customer journey view. So seven out of 10 don't have an up-to-date customer journey. So they don't really know how people are starting, uh, researching, and then ending their journey on their website. And that's something you really need to do a bit of time researching. These are some really good uh, posters from the user research team at GovUK. I don't know if you've tried to do your tax online, or car tax, or, or anything else. They're a really good team. Their big focus is on user improvements. And they've created a few of these really good posters, which I, I can imagine they've got all around their offices. So you are not your user. 
Don't ask how it should look, but what must it do? Finding out what works and what's not popular. Not what's popular. Because of course people love putting gimmicks and the latest thing, like we talked about with the live chat pop-ups or exit intent pop-ups. Ideas which are good natured and good intentioned, but if you're watching people and they're having a negative experience with your brand, then maybe you need to think about doing things in a slightly different way. And one of the big ones which I'm a big advocate of is by giving this information back and getting your whole team to look at the research that you're doing. Now they have um, two hours every six weeks of observing user behavior. And you can do very similar things yourself by sending out these sort of insights to your own team so that they can come up with their own creative ideas. So you can put some of these bits together and make it really easy to digest, send it to your MD, to team around you, just give them the information because a lot of people won't really have thought about the people using their site. I know I've talked to a lot of developers sometimes and, and they've said to me sometimes, well, I, I don't care how people use the site, I'm just adding functionality. <laughs> but you think you can't do that in a shop, you can't do that anywhere else. So you need to really think about how people are using your product, that product being your website. And I really think that start with some research because some research is better than no research. It really is. And this stuff is really addictive. The more you do of it, the more you want to do. Because it, you just keep on finding information and insights you never knew before. The really good thing as well with usability is that it is an impartial voice. You can't really question if people were having a problem and then you're showing it back. Now I had somebody the other day um, say to me, their website was clunky. It's a fair enough comment, but the problem was we were working on this project for him and their big target was on generating leads. And his problem was on the account area. Now, to some people and even to some agencies, they would have rubbed their hands at this and thought, brilliant, we can redesign this. We can just go to town. But actually it was moving away from their key metrics of generating leads and sales. So what we ended up doing is we put a survey on the site for people using the My Account section for two weeks and we got over 140 respondents and we asked them all sorts of different questions on their experience and one of them had a few words and they said what words would you relate to this product and we had clunky on there and it was about three percent so it's not like we're proving that the MD or the highest important person's opinion is wrong but it's just giving them the information they need what we actually found was 79 percent of people said they were somewhat satisfied or very satisfied with it so we made some small tweaks, but then went back to the big focus, which is on generating sales. And what I said was, don't take your eye off the KPIs. We're working on improving the website for the business. Now we could just keep on adding functionality, but if we're actually changing their bottom line, they're going to come back to us a lot more, a lot more often, and we can make measurable changes for them. And then that's my next point, it's on the success metrics. Because if you do make a change, and it has an improvement, and you're not able to feed that back, how are you going to continue the process? Without measuring something, how effective can you say the change was? So find a way of being able to measure in whatever way it is that change has. I've seen it for myself. This strengthens the effect the user experience has on the very top. I've had people say how user experience is fluffy and uh, nice to have and it's the polish at the end. But it's really not, it's really fundamental. What you need to do is have your user experience insights and team side by side with sales and marketing. Because bringing in leads and creating a better experience are all part of the same process. It's just like the sales pitch, but for the website. A really great way of doing that is by A-B testing. So if you're not sure what A-B testing is, it's using your existing page, and then create a variation page and taking your audience 50-50 down to each one of the pages. All this allows you to do is track the right sort of metrics. Now, it depends on what page it is. If it's a form, then it's the form submission. If it's an e-commerce store, you probably want to be tracking things like average order value and um, the conversion rate itself. Because what we found is we made a change to one client and although the conversion rate went up, average order value actually went down. So if we were just tracking one metric, 
we would have made that change, rolled it out, and increased conversion rates. But actually, to his bottom line, average order value was going down. So he was generating less money from each customer. So think about the metrics that you need to track and then apply them to the changes that you have on your site. The great thing about A-B testing as well is it uses data and it allows you to be statistically significant. So you can remove any element of chat of doubt and you can say that for certain, one page has had an improvement of X percent. And we recommend running these for quite a long period of time so you're definitely, definitely certain of this. You might have seen some of the boards um, in the exhibition area. This is an actual test that we ran. Uh, the one on the left was a page with a form on it. The one on the right was a page with a button on it. The messaging is slightly different. If you can't read it up here, we've got the boards over um, to the right. So have a think and tweet if you're not sure which one of those pages increased the lead generation by 18%. And if you want to achieve, go straight to the answer. It's at ecomsw.co.uk forward slash AV. But have a think about which one you think yourself would create the best effect, and then find out whether your intuition is right. Of course, AV testing can measure a couple or a few key metrics. But if you're trying to test something like an improved navigation, which has a lot of different endpoints, sometimes you need slightly different ways of doing that. You can also do it by tree testing, which replicates your navigation as a drop-down, and then you ask people to look for certain pages in that navigation. And then the little chart on the right uh, is showing their path they took. And obviously the bigger and the greener that path is, the more successful it was. But if people went down a navigation, went to the wrong place, had to go back and choose another link, that was shown as a, a blue line or a red line if they went completely to the wrong page. So there are all sorts of different ways of being able to test changes. And of course, if you feed these uh, findings back to your team, it's showing that you're being able to measure and improve them. And the more you can do this and continue to refine it, the more you've got a business case for really making user experience changes. So this is a process that I've used a lot to avoid any sort of scattergun approaches. I mean, if you just chuck out a lot of ideas, you might have some wins, but it's hard to repeat that process again and again. So when people are coming and saying, oh, I want to get some improvements, you need to create a plan which is going to work for 6, 12, 24 months. So this is something you can continue to refine. If you're doing your bounce rate report, run it again in 30 days, in 90 days, find out whether those pages, those same pages are there, or whether there are different ones, and then you can repeat the process again. There is an element of instinct in this, but the more you do it, you sort of start seeing how customers are behaving. And the more you start understanding that, the better you can create the pages for them. Then it's just a case of going and refining and refining. So, thank you very much today. If you've got any questions, come and talk to me at the end. Um, thank you very much.